Thank you everyone for gathering together this evening. My name is Lashandra Sullivan. I'm a professor in the anthropology department here at Reed College. I am thrilled to introduce our featured speaker for the 2023 Sex, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Symposium and Vine Deloria Lecture, Dr. Jamaica Heolime Leilakani, Lekalani Osorio. I practiced that and it's still fumbling. So, oh, wow. Okay, I'm working on it. <laughs> Professor Osorio is a Kanaka Maoli Wahine artist, activist, and scholar. She's an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in the Department of Political Science. She's the author of the award winning book, Remembering Our Intimacies Mo'oelo, Aloha, Aina, and Ea, which was published in 2021 by the University of Minnesota Press. She's also a three-time national poetry champion and a poetry mentor. In 2020, her poetry and activism were the subject of an award-winning film, This Is the Way We Rise. She was also a lead artist and co-writer of the documentary On the Morning You Wake to the End of the World, which won the XR Experience Jury Award at South by Southwest 2022. I first became familiar with Professor Osorio's work due to my own research in Brazil with indigenous Guarani land activists in Mato Grosso do Sul and with black feminist lesbian activists in Rio de Janeiro. Professor Osorio's work in Hawaii resonated with what I was witnessing with activists in Brazil. The fierce rejection of settler colonial modes of domination by state and non-state apparatuses, as well as the creative and agentive forging of an otherwise to such subjugation through decolonial, indigenous, and Afro-diasporic conceptions of the world. Professor Osorio's work concerns how moments and ways of living, including, but also beyond overt acts of politics, open up and undermine settler colonial presuppositions regarding categories of gender, sex, and sexuality, challenging the underpinnings of how hegemonic political, economic, and social orders operate. It is this bringing together in the same frame of both formal political uprising and more quotidian enactments of living otherwise to the historical repetitions of settler colonial turned nationalist and capitalist forms of domination that I find so striking and beautiful in Professor Osorio's work. It resonates with black queer artist and performance studies scholar E. Patrick Johnson's argument that such shared framings illuminate the most cutting edge theories for shaping our, word, our worlds theories formulated and carried out in practice by those marked ethno-racially, gendered, class, and sexed in the streets, as it were, not in the academy. The performances occurring as everyday, mundane acts of living by people are embodied sites from which to learn how survival, and more than survival, occurs in the flesh, and the daily encounters with structures of interlocking oppressions. In a given moment, they, we, don't just simply reenact or reiterate the dominant discursive regimes structuring the political, economic, and social orders. We also exceed those scripts. As, both, as works in black queer studies have long argued, if we understand queerness to be outside and outside to the hegemonic norms, to white cis heteropatriarchal unmarked subjectivity so vi that is so violently insisted upon through the marking and subjugation of others, then in practices of everyday life, they, we, in our outsideness, make space to live, to more than survive, presenting an otherwise to mere ab abjection. This living otherwise reshapes our worlds, remakes what is possible. And it seems to me that such acts of world making are precisely what E. Patrick Johnson meant by what he calls theory in the flesh. Professor Osorio's work, if I may, and she will correct me if I'm wrong, pushes us to further consider the ways that the flesh and its materiality is co-constituted by matter of all sorts, particularly what gets called the landscape or the environment. In Hawaii, the Kanaka Maoli concept of aina encompasses the mountains, the sand, the flora, the water, for example, entangled and entwined with and as agentive creator transformers of the world and the ever-flowing motions of their material bodies. Such conceptions and practices present other ways of dwelling, ways of moving together in relations. The interplay of bodies in motion, attending to the bonds, pleasures, fissures, relations of care, mutuality, 
co-constitutiveness that are also acts of confrontations with state and non-state apparatuses of governance. Native Hawaiian conceptions and practices transmitted in Mo'uelo's stories and storytelling, for example, and practices of Pelina and Upena, in which gender, sexuality, and notions of personhood don't adhere to and quite radically counter so-called Western settler colonial forms of recognition, governance, and notions of moral personhood. They offer insights into forms of mutual accountability, mutual desire, and caretaking as an otherwise to the violent statecraft and extractive relations, including capitalist tourism and unethical techno-scientific enterprises that get imposed on Hawaii. It is my great privilege to welcome Professor Osorio to share some of her work with us today. Her scholarship, her activism, her artistry are a tremendous source of learning and inspiration. Professor Osorio, we thank you for joining us here and for sharing your insights with our community as we continue to pursue our collective aspirations to survive, and more than survive, to thrive, to engage in, to study, and support in coalition the transformations and reshaping of our worlds. Everyone, please join me in welcoming to Reed College, Professor Jamaica Heo Lemele Kalani Osorio. in my generation. I have seen an island born from cold, from a whisper in the quietest parts of ourselves, a promise we refuse to forsake or forget that this place is ours. Only so much as this place gives us. And I have held it in my hands. The very many worlds, coal turned light, turned people, turned slime, turned gods in the time of mere men. I have watched the call of the intrepid summon Manaya Kalani every morning in the hands of our elder sibling, Maui, fishing us one by one in the dark sea of this world. By devotion, it is only because I have sailed deep into the realm of my ancestors. I have crossed the people from Wafea to Wafea, and I have traveled upon the dark and shining road of cotton. And I have returned on their promise to commit yourself to your moral level, to cast your eyes upon Kuei Island and to pull the shimmering body from the skin of the sea. If I have anger, it is because I know the stories of our loss. Ki'i burnt to ash, stones and ko'a removed, and now the foundations of billionaire estates. I am aware that nearly everywhere we walk, we are trampling on the bones of my ancestors. I know the mobile level of the hundreds of thousands dead and dying. I have seen the signs of the separating sicknesses born again like Omea in every Hawaiian generation. I know the names of the thieves, the crooks and finely sewn suits praying to their capital as they pillage and loot our holy city, leaving us with nothing but a whisper of what we once believed, and yet I still have a little hope. But only because we are still here with all our kukuna standing beside us. And so when I stand in your mind, in your shoe, you tell the whole thing like a recollection, like a mountain. There's so many stories I will never know in languages I will never speak. You are here. And your kaumaha, your grief, it is not foreign to you. You feel more family than strength. And in your magnificent shadow, I hear it. Our to prayer. Aloha mai Let's try that again. And in Hawaii, if I say aloha mai kako, you gotta say aloha back, otherwise you're like slapping me in the face. Aloha mai kako. Aloha. Oh, that was so good. You guys are great. <laughs> um, I don't know why this isn't on. It's probably something I did wrong. And, and the smart guy with the tech ran away. There he is. What'd I do? Um, Would you check the mic real quick? I don't think it's on. Yeah, it's on. Okay, cool. Um, while, while he's fixing what I messed up, thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm going to ask your, your patience and forgiveness up front. I'm going to do something a little different, uh, which is do something kind of new. 
unpracticed and untested, which means there'll be more reading than I would like this evening. Um, but the, the work that I'm going to share with you folks is really close to my heart. And um, the hope is that there'll be plenty of time for Q&A, and so much less time of me staring at this thing trying to share a story with you and more time with you. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. This is uh, Mauna Awakea, in case you're wondering. Um, <clears throat> this is a time of incredible struggle. It is a time marked by ongoing dispossession of native presence and life. It is a time punctuated by the climax of state power and violence, both domestically and abroad. It is a time of removal, re refiguration and denial, a time of hunger and desire, a time of rising water and swelling temperatures. It is a time of contamination and contagion. As we have in the generations before, it's a time where too many of us have gone missing and unaccounted for. Some of us have been killed in the streets without apology or remorse. Our beloved family members have been removed from our communities to fill prisons, while others have been snared by the extended grip of its industrial complex. All of us live lives defined by carceral systems meant to surveil, confine, and discipline not only our behavior, but certainly our imaginations. But this is not a time of surrender. It is a time of resistance, refusal, creativity. It is a time of renewal and overturning. In Hawaii, we would call this a huli hia. And in this time, we have witnessed many powerful movements emerge and flow from native refusals to settler colonial rule at Standing Rock in Minnesota and Wet'suwet'en, where reconciliation was officially declared dead to the fight over the right to return and ongoing cries for deoccupation in Palestine. We have challenged capitalism's omnipresence and cheered on the union boom. We stepped into the streets, took back the night, and fiercely declared and insisted on the value and preciousness of black lives. And it is because of this that I'm able to say with confidence that we are the light our radical ancestors carried forward and fought to protect. So we must carry on in this radical and resurgent tradition by doing what Robin Kelly has instructed, continue tapping the well of our own collective imaginations that we do what earlier generations have done, dream. To know where these dreams will lead is difficult to say, but it is also certain that dreaming is the first step in a decolonial abolitionist future. It is one place where we can, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore has called us to do, begin to change one thing which is everything. This dream comes from a long and vibrant history of my people resisting and rising against ongoing colonialism and imperialism in my homeland in Hawaii. It is a dream I lived at the base of a sacred mountain, an abolitionist dream where I saw and felt our people at the cusp of transformation. It is a dream about what is possible from these contested front lines where we bring the present of abolition in contact with the everyday violence of the carceral state. And so I'm a Hawaiian, so I have to start with the genealogy. I am the daughter of longtime Hawaiian musician and activist Jonathan Kei Kamakiwa Ole Osorio. Um, he was born and raised in Hilo in the magnificent and powerful Malu shade and protection of Mauna Awakea. But he moved to Honolulu uh, in his adolescence to, to study. As an adult, he became a student and later a colleague of these two brilliant radical Hawaiian activist, um, and scholar, and also um, colleagues Trask, um, Trask is most widely known and celebrated for her vicious attacks on all things white supremacist and colonial. She was a student, student of Malcolm X's work and his speeches and a fervent supporter of the Black Panther program. As a scholar and educator, she traced the political and intellectual, <clears throat> sorry, po political and intellectual lineage, lineages of the black movement across the grain of the Hawaiian movement. And therefore, she illuminated shared genealogies. And she founded her Hawaiian studies curriculum on, the rad on radical black thought. Malcolm X, Franz Fanon, Ngugi Thiong'o, Angela Davis, Audre Lorde, um, all of them made a significant portion of her syllabi. And because of her, a whole generation of young Hawaiian scholars who were interested in the question of sovereignty were directed to those questions through a study 
of the black radical tradition and black liberation. It's because of her work, her and her work, that I know that, um, that I'm a descendant of the Hawaiian Renaissance, a contemporary movement that begins in pole, the dark and churning heat of creation. And this movement culminated in the resistance to the illegal overthrow and annexation in the late 19th century. This is a picture of uh, annexation petitions that were gathered uh, in the late 1800s where nearly every living Hawaiian signed in fight against annexation. So don't let anyone tell you that we wanted to be Americans. Uh, this is a picture of Jonah Kukio Polonia Ole, who was imprisoned in 1895 and sentenced to be hung. Uh, he wasn't hung, but he was sentenced to be hung um, after an armed rebellion against the propped up government. And this is um, a depiction of a number of Hawaiians gathering to organize against, against annexation. So this movement, this anti-colonial movement in Hawaii is old. It is not new. Uh, it has been going on for generations. But I also know that our people began to rise again in the late 60s and early 70s. We gazed across the ocean towards anti-war movements, occupations at Alcatraz and Wounded Knee, nonviolent dis civil disobedience, and struggles won by any means necessary. In Oceania, we joined a fight against nuclear weapons and testing in the Pacific. And at home, we fought displacement, disenfranchisement across our islands. We wrote songs, we organized marches, engaged in direct action. We revived ancient irrigation systems for lo'i and loko'i'a to create other food producing systems to feed our people. We studied the technologies of our ancestors and built canoes and sailed them around the Pacific and then around the world without modern navigational instruments. We put our bodies on an island used for target practice and lost two Hawaiian souls on the way. Kumu Haunani and her colleagues and their students taught me this history. And in 2019, we built upon it at the base of the sacred mountain, Mauna Awakea. So I gotta tell you a little bit about this Mauna. Mauna Awakea is the sacred child of uh, Wakea and Ho'ohoku Kalani. Uh, she is the highest point in the Pacific, the largest mountain in the world when measured from her base below the sea, uh, below sea level. Um, in Hawaii, she is the pinnacle and pico, the umbilical cord of our ea, our life, our rising, our sovereignty. Um, and for a number of years, she's been threatened by astronomical development. Astronomy development? Astro I don't know, I'm not good with those words. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about this history. In 1968, um, the BLNR, the Board of Land and Natural Resources, they issued a general lease to the summit of the mountain to the University of Hawaii. That's the university I work for. You can tell them I'm talking smack about them. Um, they were supposed to build one observatory. Um, over 20 years, developers built a number of telescope complexes without permits. And because of public protests, the board issued after the fact permits for their structures. We weren't very happy with that. In 1985, uh, one of the things you need to know about this lease is that it could be vacated at any point if there was documented mismanagement by the Board of Land and Natural Resources or by the University of Hawaii. Um, in 1983, there was a Mauna Kea complex development plan was finalized and it approved up to 13 telescopes by the year 2000. In 1998, the Hawaii State Auditor releases a scathing report of 30 years of mismanagement of the mountain by the Land Board and the University of Hawaii. Um, let's see, 12 years later, they um, file a conservation use uh, application for the TNT project. So 30 years of mismanagement, they still get to keep the mountain because that's how it works in the state of Hawaii. Um, all of this is the, if people, anyone familiar with kind of the Mauna Kea protests that blew up in 2019 and 2020? Maybe you saw pictures on Instagram or maybe, I don't know, it might have been on Democracy Now or something like that. It was kind of all over the place. A lot of people don't understand, like, they don't get it. Like, what's the point? What's wrong with the telescopes? This is what's wrong with the telescopes. Mismanagement, uh, lack of consent, but also this summit, the entire mountain is actually a part of a collection of lands called, the state calls them ceded lands, but they're lands that were seized at the time of the overthrow, uh, crown and government lands that they turned into public lands, but these lands belong to the Hawaiian Kingdom. And so the state is making decisions about what to do with Hawaiian Kingdom lands, that also pisses us off. Okay, so what happens? 
the 30 meter telescope in 2010, they apply for this, they submit an application to build what would be the largest, most devastating structure built in the conservation use district on the mountain. That's the other thing. There's like some parts of the mountain that are just supposed to be for conservation, but if you're a telescope, you can go there anyway, even though that's not conservation. I don't understand it, don't ask me. Okay, so this culminated in a number of standoffs. In particular, uh, 2014 and 2015, um, a great number of young Hawaiians, like early 20s, they ascended the mountain and basically refused to move until, um, no, until the mountain wasn't threatened anymore. Um, I love this quote by Mohammed Kuhoy. She says, TMT thought they were going to build a telescope instead. They will the nation. Uh, and these are some pictures. This is from 2015, when about 1,000 people ascended the mountain up to, I think, 14,000 feet. Um, and they blocked, they blocked the entire uh, uh, group of construction vehicles trying to get their way up the mountain. This is from, from um, Across numerous demonstrations since 2014, at least 80 kia'i, uh, that's the word for protectors in Hawaiian, uh, including 38 elders were arrested, have been arrested for their ongoing protection of the mauna. Perhaps the most critical shift in strategy, and this is what I'm, I'm really interested here, was in 2019, the choice to establish a pu'uhonua at the site Pu'uhuluhulu, which is at the base, of, actually across the street from the access road to the summit of the mountain. Um, at, and Pu'uhonua is a place for refuge, sanctuary, asylum. And we're gonna talk more specifically what, what that institution comes from. Um, on July 14th, 2019, about 100 protectors gathered at Pu'uhuluhulu and they consecrated this Pu'uhonua. And this collective return to ceremonial practice and ceremonial governance via the revival of the Pu'uhonua represents a climax to a multi-generational struggle to reclaim Hawaiian practices. For many of us studied in the politics and theories of abolition, it also represented a critical shift and opportunity to expand the political consciousness of our movement to connect more meaningfully with ongoing challenges of the carceral state. The Pu'uhonua became home to the 2019-2020 battle to protect Mauna Awakea, um, but it was more than just a front line. It was a kitchen here. First the kitchen was here, but then we needed a bigger one, so we moved it here. Uh, it fed thousands of people a day. Uh, it was also a place where you could get excellent medical care from doctors and traditional um, healers. Um, it was a place where people were offered shelter, all peoples, including those without access to stable and secure housing otherwise. It was a place that uh, where the essential needs of every person was considered and met. At the Pu'uhonua, we became students in ceremonial instruction across the road. So this is, what they call it, the Daniel K. No, we're not going to call it that, because students are racers. Uh, this is Saddle Road. This road that runs up is what they call the Malakea Access Road, which is later renamed Kiala Kukuna, after the Kukuna, who basically took up residence in that tent of the Kukuna elders to block construction vehicles. This itself was the Pu'uhonua, but then extended to what poor case called last car to last car, because on some days there would be cars stretched for miles in each direction. Um, anyway, we did ceremony three times a day on the Monica access road at sunrise, at Kaukalai Global, sun, when the sun was over our heads and at sunset, to remind everyone, including ourselves, who was ceremonially governing that space, right? Whose jurisdiction was this space? It wasn't the state of Hawaii. It wasn't gonna be DOCARE, who were the police officers with the Department of Land and Natural Resources. It certainly wasn't the Sheriff's Department. It was the kupuna and then the deities we would call together three times a day at this mauna. Um, most of all, the Pu'uhonua was where many of us became witness to a myriad of state and police intimidation tactics. And that's not to say that many of us didn't already have contested relationships with the police, but it was a place where we, a lot of us saw it every single day and inflicted on a different, like a different class of people. Our elders in particular was pretty stunning for many of us to watch and experience. We learned and then trained thousands of our people in the principles of nonviolent direct action. And so it's not surprising that it was also here at the Pu'uhonua that I first saw a glimpse of an abolitionist dream, where the politics around policing, criminalization, and indigenous sovereignty were put to test in my own body. 
and where most importantly I and so many others were given a glimpse to an alternative to our carceral society, a place to live otherwise. This experience has led me to study of Pu'uhonua throughout Hawaii's history with an attention to how this system and institution might help support a decolonial abolitionist future in Hawaii and beyond. We like to share, so if anything is useful, you may take it. Um, just don't tell the state of Hawaii. Um, okay, so historicizing the Pu'uhonua. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Hawaiian language newspapers. Okay, cool, awesome. Why, anyone want to tell everyone about them? No? Okay, I can do it, it's fine. Uh, Hawaiian language newspapers begin in 1834 when missionaries bring over a printing press mostly to teach us about God and to import all kinds of weird ideas about gender and sexuality and like domestication of women. Really weird stuff. I don't know if you've heard about this stuff, but it's great. <laughs> um, but us Hawaiians, like we love new technology, so we flooded to the new technology and we started publishing our own newspapers. And between 1834, I keep tripping over this. Okay, between 1834 and like the mid-1900s, we published over a hundred different newspapers. Not a hundred different issues, a hundred different newspapers. Over a million pages in the Hawaiian language in this archive exist to this day, written mostly by Hawaiians and entirely about things that Hawaiians care about. So international, national news, yes, absolutely. Uh, stories and songs, absolutely. Political commentary, religious commentary, all of this stuff exists in this archive. Um, almost entirely ignored by white historians. In fact, they said that we didn't know how to read and what write when Hawaiians were the most literate country at the time. By 1843, we had like a 90% literacy rate in Hawaiian, but also many of us speak reading and writing English as well. So, okay, so <laughs> totally ignored by historians. They wrote their own history about what Hawaii was. All of it was wrong. If you want to learn more about that, read some work by Kumuhononike Trask or Lily Kalakamele Bluba. Um, you can read my book too, but it's not as good as theirs, so you start there. Um, it's a great place to look for what did our ancestors think about this thing? It's like the catch all, right? And it's a place where a lot of people start with different research projects. I want to know what my people thought about police. Well, what's the fine word for police? Makai. Let's search for the newspapers and see what they're saying about cops. Um, I decided to start with Pupu Honua. In the newspaper, that's what this word means, there are about 3,000 mentions of Pupu Honua in the searchable database. So not all of it is searchable, but that's still, that's still to work with. Let's start there. Over 90% of the searchable articles are published between the 1860s and 1920s. Over 20% are published in this period between 1890 and 1900. Anyone want to tell me why that matters? What happens between 1890 and 1900? Yeah, the overthrow, the fake annexation, the Republic of Hawaii, all of that is happening in this period. And we're talking a lot about Pukuhonua when all of that's happening. I think that's interesting. Okay. So when we start looking at kind of early understandings of Pukuhonua in the Hawaiian Kingdom, um, of course, we got to talk about Kamehameha. Um, according to the articles published in the Hawaiian Language Newspaper Archive, these are governing traditions that exist as early as the 13th century. So I'm not a historian, but that feels like a really long time ago. Uh, by the time of Kamehameha, who lived in the uh, late 18th, early 19th century, Pu'uhono would become much more prevalent. Uh, Kamehameha was the conqueror who unified or conquered or um, he brought all the islands together under his rule. Uh, yeah, he's a polarizing figure. A lot of people in Hawaii really love him, but I could see why if you were a follower of a different chief that you may not like him so much. He's the guy who brought it all together as one big family. Um, Kamehameha is highly regarded as a devoted religious, uh, and not Christian, but like Hawaiian religious leader. Um, and it's one of the things, along with being an expert warrior, it's one of the things that they say made him so successful. Um, he's celebrated for erecting several heo, and heo are like traditional places of worship. Um, but Pu'uhonua were in particular were among these. And in this article here, oh, why did you give me this whole thing written in Hawaiian? Don't worry, I'll tell you what it says. Um, Samuel Kamako, who is an esteemed 19th century Hawaiian scholar, um, he talks about the major shifts in governance under the rule of Kamehameha, and the first um, being achieved by his devotion to his god, Kuka'ili Moku. Um, his war god, Kuka'irimoku, who's 
basically the reason that Kamehameha, they say, won all the wars that he ever fought in. Um, but according to Kamakau, all the lands that he dedicated to his war god were to be Pu'uhonua, and that those Pu'uhonua would be lands in which blood would never be shed, and there would never be human sacrifice. He describes these Pu'uhonua as places where all wrongdoings and sins against the ruling powers would be forgiven, and the perpetra perpetrators offered refuge instead of death or punishment. Kamako goes on to explain this is point number two, the Kana Waima Malahoi. This image is an artistic rendering of the Kana Waima Malahoi um, as a major shift in Kamehameha's governing um, practice. The Kana Waima Malahoi was a proclamation that Kamehameha gave after, it's kind of a crazy story, but he was like arbitrarily chasing after these two fishermen. I'm not sure why, because he was powerful and he could do whatever he wanted. But his foot got stuck in the lava rock in the Pahoehoe, and so one of the fishermen came back and shattered his paddle across the skull of the chief. Now, in this time, this guy just standing here and casting his shadow on the chief could have been killed, but he struck his head. And instead of killing this man, Kwemeha declares this new law of the land, the Kanava Malahoi, the, the law of the splintered paddle. He says, e kanaka, e kanaka nui, kanaka iki. All you people, take care of those big and small. Um, take care of the elderly and the young. He says, let the old and young and the weak lie in the streets without fear of harm. Disobey and you shall die. This is regarded as one of the very first like human rights proclamations, especially in Hawaii. Um, and the idea that people, all people, had the right to life and prosperity regardless of their manna, their power, their genealogy, um, that they should live. What's really interesting to me about Kamehameha and his shift with this law and his consecration of a number of Pu'uhonu, including Kona now here, which is a really famous one. You can still visit in Kona. Please be respectful. Um, what's really interesting to me is that these things are created by the decree of the Ali'i, right? They are empowered because of the manna, the power and authority of the ruling chief to govern. But at the same time, the Pu'uhonu represent the limitations and judgments of the Ali'i. They are systems created to balance the power of those ruling to observe in the protection of the lahui, the people. The ongoing maintenance of the pu'uhonua as part of the governing practice distinguishes the early Hawaiian kingdom from other ruling states in the early 19th century, and that ensured that all people had access to places of refuge, peace, um, and peace as necessar necessary components of a pono, just and balanced society. And so, for those of you who don't know, the way that Pu'uhonua were explained to me as a child, it was like base. Like if you could just find your way there, it doesn't matter what you did, you, you would be safe and you wouldn't be punished, right? And these would exist in different parts of the island and you could, in some places you'd have to plead your case, but in other places, just being in the power of that place was enough to forgive you for whatever, we wouldn't have used the word sins, but whatever sins you had um, engaged in, okay. By the early 19th century, the Pu'uhonua also becomes an institution significantly rooted in the power of women's leadership, specifically Pu'amwanu, gorgeous of the Inui, um, when she and all her personal land holdings were named as Pu'uhonua. So Ka'ahumanu was, uh, the Haole scholars will tell you she was Manila's favorite wife, but they weren't married. Um, he had plenty of lovers, and none of them said, I do. Um, they weren't married, okay, anyway, so favorite lover, he names, she's super powerful for a lot of reasons. Most of it, one of the reasons is that she has, um, she has relations with a lot of other highly powerful chiefs, so she's able to influence um, a lot of the governance that's happening in early uh, Kingdom Hawaii. Anyway, Kamehameha as a way to both, not necessarily control her power, but to have influence upon her power. He says, you, your body, and all of your lands are now Pu'uhonua. And in doing that, he gives Ka'ahumanu the ability to pardon anyone of anything. Even if Kamehameha himself, the Mo'i, the highest ruling person in Hawaii at the time, disagrees. That she has the overthrow, over, overall power of, of life. And Kamako, the same guy we talked about earlier, when he writes about this, this is actually part of the same article, um, he describes this act as creating a deity of Ka'ahumanu. She's now a god above Kamehameha. Um, and it's her godliness that gives her the power to grant life. Um, 
this recognition of Ka'ahumanu's manna, her power, and the manna of Wahine women to govern in the early Hawaiian kingdom was carried out after her death by the office of the Kuhina Nui. So she basically becomes the first Kuhina Nui. I can't remember the English word for this, but she was like the second in command in the Hawaiian kingdom. Of the six people who took this office between 1819 and 1864, when, when the office had disappeared, three of them were women. All of them took the name Kaumanu after her. Just like the Kamehamehas, who continued to rule after Kamehameha the first, also took his name. So they became a ruling institution in themselves. The direct correlation between the right to pardon and offer refuge and the power to rule the people was verbally enacted in 1819 as a part of Kamehameha's dying proclamation. He said, no liho liho ke opuni, uh, liho liho of my son, uh, to him belongs the government. A o ka'ahumanu ke kanaka, and to ka'ahumanu the people. So he splits the governing power between the, the duties of the government itself, the institution itself, and the structures that it will build, and the duties of the person looking out, the, the, the institution that will look out for the life and the uh, refuge of the people. Um, now beyond the historical articles like this one, um, there are plenty of others that mention Pu'uhonua from in a huge range between detailed descriptions of the building and consecrating of them where you could find some of them that we may not have otherwise known about. But they also reference people and institutions as Pu'uhonua. Uh, in the latter category, several political and social commentary articles were published comparing certain chiefs and newly enacted institutions as Pu'uhonua during times of distress. In the hundreds of articles I've read, the characterizing of the Pu'uhonua as places of refuge, safety, care, and health is consistent. The capaciousness of Pu'uhonua as an idea speaks to its strength and importance as a Hawaiian institution historically. And so it's not surprising that Pu'uhonua are used to describe hospitals during times of prevalent disease and death, or to describe the manna and mercy of a new god during a time of great conversion and uncertainty. I argue that the institution and the ideals and values it upholds continue to be relevant to Native Hawaiians today as we envision a just and abundant society that prioritizes the well-being of all our aina, all of our land, and all of our peoples. And apparently I'm not the only one who thinks this because this institution um, has been reborn a number of times, especially since the 1980s. Um, they start to revision this institution amongst a number of failures by the state. Uh, the first documented example that I know of uh, and you, if you know others, I'd love to hear them because I'd like, love to learn more, um, is the establishment of the Pu'uhonua at Makua. Uh, anyone ever been to Makua on Oahu? Okay, Makua is on the west-facing um, shore of Oahu, um, our capital island. Um, Makua means parent. It is a place that our kupuna and our people continue to believe is sacred, and she has a gorgeous valley behind like, this way. Um, Following the armed coup of Queen Ili'o Kalani in 1893 and the, you know, the illegal overthrow, we talked about this, the entire ca catalog of crown and government lands were usurped by this new propped up government. Uh, this was some of that land at Makua. So some people call this ceded lands, let's call them seized. Um, in 1941, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii was under martial law and a number of lands were basically picked up for military readiness and military training. Um, this is how Ko'olawe, if you guys are familiar, that was bombed for a number of years until like the 1970s, 1980s, uh, becomes a place of target practice. The same thing happens in Makua. And they shelled and did target practice in that valley for years. And they're still training in that valley. I think technically they're not doing live bombing, but it sounds like live bombing. I don't know what the difference is. Anyway, so they're still training in that valley. Uh, there was an executive order in 1964 that this Pohaku Loa, which is also on the base of Mauna Kea and others, were formally usurped by the federal government for military training uh, for national security. Um, we can talk more about that later if you want. But even with all of that, all of that military activity in the area, there were people taking refuge at this place in Makua. And some of them were folks who had been pushed out of the valley. Others are folks who had just been pushed out of other places in Hawaii because of housing insecurity. Um, and the astronomical rising cost of living. 
in uh, the Pu'uhono itself, though, wasn't officially started until 1983 after a violent police sweep that decimated the community there. And according to these residents, um, they established this place of refuge specifically for people trying to survive a society that criminalizes poverty. By 1996, the council had organized systems that included the sharing of food, water, transportation of children to school, and a neighborhood watch. Essentially, this community created systems of care and resource sharing in the absence and failures of the state. But on the morning of June 18, 1996, the state of Hawaii, under the authority of Governor Cayetano, what a jerk, and the force of the Oahu Sheriff's Department, they invaded the Pu'uhonua and removed the entire community of about 300 people. 80 sheriffs, um, predominantly Native Hawaiian police officers, strengthened by the overwhelming backup, descended on this community with semi-automatic guns, drawn and handcuffs ready to arrest and destroy them. 16 people were arrested. Dozens of supporters were cleared from the area and the entire coast closed off as bulldozers raised their homes to the ground. Just a couple years before the violent sweep at Makua, the Pu'uhonua Owai Manalo was established as a part of a struggle over land base for Native Hawaiian self-determination. This Pu'uhonua is now home to an organization that calls itself the Nation of Hawaii, and it came to be after a standoff between a handful of Hawaiian families occupying lands around Makapu'u in 1987. The occupation and the refusal of state authority culminated in a standoff between these families and the Honolulu, Honolulu Police Department's SWAT team. And they always like bring big guns when it's babies and aunties, right? Um, the conflict landed Waimanalo community organizer Bumpy Kanahele, who I don't have a picture of here, but if you've seen the movie Aloha, he's in it. He was landed in prison for 14 months, but in 1994, he led another occupation of approximately 100 Kanaka at Makapu'u Beach, and that forced then-Governor uh, John Waihe'e to intervene. Following the frontline engagement and a number of negotiations, the state would eventually offer a 55-year lease to the lands now comprised as the Pu'uhonua o Waimanalo. And this Pu'uhonua continues to this day to be a site of resistance and resurgence where people organize alternatives to the state within what they came, claim to be their sovereign geography. And I should share that this uh, Pu'uhonua can be polarizing to some because they assert themselves as the nation of Hawaii, but they're doing really innovative and interesting stuff and they're, they're asking difficult questions and they're creating institutions outside of the state. And so to me, you know, me and these guys don't always agree on all the things. They're, they don't really have a feminist or a you know, queer approach, but they're doing good work and they're creating otherwise in a way that's really meaningful. Um, and so I, I wanted to highlight them and they're, they're still around. Okay, why and I? About a decade later in the early 2000s, residents of the existing houseless encampment at the White and I Boat Harbor organized to develop a Pu'uhonua in order to address existing safety and sanitation concerns. The Pu'uhonua framework allowed the community to establish and maintain a set of community agreements and a system of primarily women leadership to uphold them. As such, the Pu'uhonua o White and I has become a community-led alternative to state and city-run shelters and works to create a safe environment for all and any family struggling across the spectrum of housing insecurity. Uh, against incredible public complaint and police harassment, this 250 person community has upheld itself for almost two decades, for over two decades, and recently in 2020, fundraised enough money to purchase a 20 acre plot of land to build a permanent housing, permanent housing community that includes individual sleeping houses along with shared bathrooms and kitchen facilities. Um, these guys are freaking radical. Um, one of the things that inspires me most about them, they're, so White and I, if you're not familiar, is an incredibly hot and dry and abandoned by the state in terms of resources area in Hawaii on the west coast of Oahu. Um, and these guys took up, created a community basically off the side of a boat harbor um, without access to a lot of the things that you know make our lives livable and joyous, and they made an incredible community out of it using the Pu'uhonua as a framework. And this one he named particular in the Borges, um major hero right there. One of the things that I love about her approach, and she's uh, basically the community propped up leader of their of their Pu'uhonua. Um, she says, not housing first, not sobriety first, community first, relationships first. 
And to me, that is so Hawaiian to recognize that like the most important thing we need to do right now is we need to establish relations with each other. We need to establish our relationship with this environment. Um, Twinkle is also very good at establishing effective relationships with the state and other agencies that have been trying to move and destroy them. Like she's brilliant. Um, but understanding that the center of all of this is our pilina, is our relations, is our intimacy with each other. Um, and I think that's a part of the reason why, why they've been successful to raise the money that they have. And I'm really, really, um, you know, things can get co-opted pretty easily when, when you get to that stage, but I've got faith in Twinkle. Um, I'm excited to see what they teach the rest of Hawaii. Um, yeah, pretty inspiring stuff. Okay, so I wanted to share some of these stories, and all of them, none of them are secrets. You could Google all those pu'uhono, you could find really great information about them, articles, all kinds of stuff, you could learn more. Um, but I wanted to share these stories as examples of a large or Hawaiian movement for ea. Can you guys say ea? Yeah. Great, you guys speak Hawaiian already, cool. Ea means life, it means to rise, it means liberation, but it's also one of our words for sovereignty. Um, and all of this fits into a larger movement for ea. Um, and this ea is in direct refusal of the settler state in Hawaii. And in this struggle, I'm particularly interested and inspired by the spread and proliferation of the pu'uhonua and, it, and its central ethics of care and refuge. I'm attentive to what these shifts in our movement strategy in Hawaii represent in terms of possibilities for future intersectional struggles around decolonization and abolition. Um, and this, what's really exciting too is that after the Pu'uhonua or Pu'uhonua, so this is at Mauna Kea in 2019, Pu'uhonua just start popping up all over the place. Movements, frontline engagements start popping up all over the place. It was like an activism boom that was painfully and quickly crushed by COVID. Um, but we see Pu'uhonua popping up in Hunananiho in Waimanalo to block the building of a sports complex uh, over an ancestral burial ground. They were successful. We see Pu'uhonua popping up in Kahuku, which is on the northern part of Oahu. Uh, and they were attempting to block uh, the building of these massive wind turbines in the center of their communities. Like, actually, like, it looks like it's right in the middle of their elementary school. Unfortunately, they were not successful. Others in Kaua'ula and elsewhere, there were just Pu'uhonua everywhere. And all of these Pu'uhonua were generating a comprehensive refusal of the colonial and occupying state its procedures, its policies, its laws and authorities. And a lot of these movements had engaged in kind of, you know, going through the motions, going through internal channels, filling out petitions and giving testimony and all that kind of stuff. And none of it worked, right? So all these people took to the front line. And at the front line, they decided that this institution is what we needed to be grounded in effective and just struggle. Um, each of the Pu'uhonua addressed ceremonial practice to a different degree. That's important to understand. Ceremonial education in Hawaii, to have it is a privilege because of the many ways that it was decimated and erased over a number of years of colonialism in Hawaii. So at the Pu'uhonua Pu'uhulu, it was very much grounded in ceremonial practice. I can't say much for the others, but I would imagine that in the 1980s, there weren't a lot of people able to leave um, some of those ceremonies or available to them. So that, that, that varied. Um, but the primary concerns across the board were always consistent. They wanted to meet the needs of the people who gathered, specifically shelter, food, materials, medical care, spiritual care. All of these things were considered across the spectrum of the Pu'uhonua. The other thing they shared is the primary challenge. Each and every single one of these Pu'uhonua were terrorized by the state via a policing scheme that included the constant threat of removal or arrest. Um, in fact, this isn't only true at the Pu'uhonua. This has been the case ever since uh, the beginning of the contemporary Hawaiian movement and probably even earlier in the 1960s. Anywhere Hawaiians have organized and insisted on our right to refuge and self-determination, we have been met with the full force of a myriad of policing agencies. In particular, at Mauna Kea, there were nine different enforcement agencies that came to remove elders and like, Elders, children um, would have been arrested if it were not for, they were a chicken. Um, nine different enforcement agencies, Makua, SWAT team, Waimanalo, SWAT team, 
White and I, I think just here, good old boys in blue, Honolulu Police Department. But everywhere we propped up a Pu'u Honua, there were police there ready to try to remove us. Um, the police tactics utilized at the Pu'u Honua have helped to make more visible the ever-present nature of policing in Hawaii, right? They aren't, these sites are not the only place this violence is taking place, right? It's just incredibly visible. Um, and we're able to see more clearly how these tactics are used every day against citizens to achieve order and maintain control. As is true elsewhere across the United States and the world, policing either via sweeps, threats of arrest, or invasion by riot-trained officers represents an ongoing challenge to all liberatory work. However, the system of policing in Hawaii is not simply a symptom or response to ongoing movement work, right? And that's what they'll tell you. It's like, we're here because this is unsafe. You guys are getting a little out of control. There's too many people in the streets. We gotta keep law and order. That's what the state wants you to think, right? The cops are there because we're out here organizing. But the cops are visible because we're out here organizing. The system of policing in Hawaii and elsewhere, um, it's woven into the very structure of the state itself. Uh, in abolition scholarship, we call this the carceral society. For Foucault, you guys know Foucault? I don't understand him either, it's okay. Um, God, he's so scary. I think it's because he writes in French and I haven't found any translations. Um, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Don't tell anyone I said that. Um, for him, right, carcerality simply refers to a body of knowledge that reduces people to objects in order to exercise control over and through them. This, of course, disciplines both our behavior and our imaginations. And I'm really interested in that second part because um, the way our, dis our, our imaginations are disciplined tells us what we believe to be possible and therefore what we believe worthy of fighting for. That's bad English, but it's okay. It's not necessary, so on that point, it's not necessary for each resident of the Pu'uhonua or each person in the movement to end up incarcerated for the carceral system to dominate the lives of those attempting to create otherwise. Just as it is not necessary for every person involved in these movements and struggles to think of themselves as abolitionists, which is good because many of the people who are here do not think of themselves as abolitionists. I don't want to give off the idea that Hawaiians are just ahead of the game and everyone's ready to get rid of the cops and prisons. It's actually kind of a scary state of affairs in Hawaii at times. Um, but, but not everyone in the movement needs to be a self-identified abolitionist to actually be doing the work. In the words of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, these movements make a necessary concentration of energy and enthusiasm. She continues, it's the kind of thing that people have managed to achieve using this work is a sort of solidarity and energetic trajectory towards the future that makes possible doing other things. That is, what part, that is a part of what abolition requires in order to change everything. It is one example of many. So what I have to make, if I haven't already made it clear, what I have to make really clear is that this intersection I'm trying to like collide all the way into is really only possible because of the brilliant work coming out of the radical black tradition. Um, you know, I, I know a lot about Hawaiian history and a lot about Pilina and intimacy and Hawaiian stories. Um, but much of what Hawaiians are talking about in terms of struggle and organizing and activism is pulled right out of the black radical tradition. Um, because we're, we're studied in the work, but also we were trained by many of the folks who were doing the work in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and so for me in particular, again, citing this genealogy, I'm interested in these questions because of the things written by Angela Davis, Michelle Alexander, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who I just keep talking about over and over, Miriam Kaba. If you're not familiar with their work, look them up because um, they're the truth. Most recent, more recently, there have been shifts within indigenous studies and politics, which is kind of more of the field that I work more directly in that have added to this field, detailing the way the police and carceriality have always been central to the removal and dispossession of native peoples in America. Because often when we talk about abolition of the prison industrial complex or the defunding of the police, um, a lot of that gets framed through, a lot of that gets framed through the violence against our black comrades, which makes sense considering the incredible magnitude of that violence and how visible it is in this moment. But there hasn't been that much work that looked into how policing was used to move and displace um, and, and harm native people basically and remove them all across, move them all across the, the continent. 
Um, I'm thinking in particular here, if you're interested in those kinds of questions, you should read Leanne Simpson and Robin Maynard's new book, Rehearsals for Living. Their work makes a direct and clear articulation that decolonization will require abolition and that black liberation will require decolonial praxis, that you can't do them both without each other, and that we're immersed in a struggle for our lives and for the souls of this nation. And by nation, I want to make really clear, I'm not talking about the government and its institutions, I'm talking about the people. And in one way, I feel like Hawaiian studies and Hawaiian knowledge and OEV indigenous epistemologies are really useful in, in this part of the question because we had different words for the institution of the government and the, coll the collective of the people, right? Aupuni means the government itself and lahui means the people who make it so. And so there was this automatic separating of the two and an understanding of the needs of the two as distinct. Along these lines, the brilliant mahu, queer, Hawaiian scholar, activist, badass, has articulated the pu'ohonua at Waianae as a place of possibility for our people who refuse to assimilate in a settler capitalist system. In doing so, she situates the pu'ohonua in terms of a decolonial tactic and strategy for reclaiming space for the indigenous, the queer, and the poor to create and recreate ea as an intimacy to people and to place. In the margins of these texts and my own experience, I have come to see the vivid intersections between black radical struggle for liberation and Kanaka Maoli struggle for sovereignty. And of course, not just Kanaka Maoli, but indigenous struggles for sovereignty. I'm speaking beyond artificial solidarity here. I'm speaking of a world we may build together by continuing to dream and struggle together. And so as we gaze back upon our recent uprising at Pu'uhuluhulu, I am moved deeply by Ruth Wilson Gilmore's articulation of abolition that insists abolition requires that we change one thing, which is everything. Abolition is not absence, it is presence. What the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces, experiments and possibilities. Abolition is building the future from the present in all the ways that we can. And in this way, the pu'uhonua represent a punctuation in time. It is the space of the now. In the space of the now, this oivi, this indigenous intelligence, has the power to disrupt the settler colonial project and its geography. And it is a piercing through of indigenous knowledge to bring the past into the present for the future that is not forthcoming, but is right now. And in that punctuation, we bring the sovereignty of the past inherent in the institution of the pu'uhonua but also the necessary refusal of the present conditions of the settler occup occupation to create something new that is at once always old. It is a dream in the now. It is both a refusal and a creation. Our greatest victories have come from our most elaborate and transformative dreams. Let us begin and end there to build a society where my air is tied to your air where none of us are free until all of us are free. Let our dreams and knowledges guide us through a principled struggle to build systems unintelligible to the state and all its violence so that we may strive towards a fuller practice of freedom together. Mahalo. y'all doing? Do you guys need to stretch? Do you guys want to stand up and stretch before Q&A? Yeah, let's stand up. That's like, I might have put you to sleep. Let's reach up real high. Oh, that feels good. Maybe lean a little bit to the right and your left. Don't hit your person next to you. Yeah. If you can reach your toes. There you go. And when you're ready, you get comfortable again. Y'all really know how to make someone feel welcome. You needed that, yeah? I needed it. Yeah, go ahead. If you need to go, go for it. No, that's fine. Thank you, guys. Thanks for sticking around. If any of you all on the floor want to take a seat for Q&A, we can do that. If you need to leave, it won't hurt my feelings. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I like that shirt. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm happy to take questions on anything included in the presentation, but also other stuff you guys might be interested in. I know that this, uh, first of all, I know that I changed the title and subject of the talk that was on the poster. So you might have been expecting something a little different. Um, so yeah, ask away. Yeah. What's your name? Linda. Linda. Thank you for your question, Linda. Um, this is a great question. I'm. Where to begin? National security. How many of us were born after 9/11? Okay, cool. So I, I can't speak. To, I. Can't. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I was, yeah, it's crazy. Actually, I realized I was born before 9/11. Yeah, I was in like sixth grade. Um, I don't know why I asked that question. I feel like really uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> So I was, a ch I was a child, I was however old you are when you're in fifth or sixth grade when 9-11 happened. And for one thing I know that militarism and its spread across in particular the United States territories and its, its own military bases all across the Pacific um, certainly existed and was powerful pre-9-11. But many of us have experienced in the last 20 years the way that 9-11 and other events create the justification for endless war and endless violence, right? And I can't really speak to the wars before because I wasn't alive and I'm not a historian of, you know, Vietnam or World War II or World War I, but I can say in particular, right, this like Oriental Orientalism and this, and if you want to learn more about this, read Said's work, right? This ongoing push for endless war based on difference, that there is a boogeyman waiting in the shadows always that we need to be protected from. Well, what, is that, what does that produce in the United States? Well, in, in Hawaii, it produces, what is it, 25% of our land in Hawaii is military bases. Um, my daughter is frequently woken up by Black Hawks circling over our house in like a residential area. The, the military is everywhere. You go to other places in Guahan, Guam in the Pacific, it's probably the only place other than Hawaii that is like more concentrated military bases in all of America's territories. And all of this is for this propped up idea of national security, right? That these things, we must do them to keep us safe. There's a lot of actual correlation in the narrative used to justify over-policing, right? We need the police because they keep us safe. Well, it keeps certain things safe. And it keeps certain people safe, but it doesn't keep all of us safe. And in fact, a number of us um, haven't been safe for generations because of the existence of the US military. A number of us in the Pacific have had to leave our homes uh, because they've been contaminated by nuclear waste or nuclear testing. Um, some of us, you know, have, have felt the earth shake, right? When we were up on Mauna Kea, you could feel the earth shaking because of the, the practicing, practicing. They were, gonna, they were doing at Bohakulua. Not all of us are safe because of national security. Most of us are not. And certainly people around the world are not safe because of our ideas around national security. And so I think we begin there and we ask who counts, right? Who's a person that we are keeping safe and secure? And 
there are women activists in Hawaii in the Pacific in particular who have been really good around how to discuss these issues because in Hawaii, much like with policing, we all have a family member in the military. You, you, I've never met a Hawaiian that doesn't have a family member in the military and doesn't have like a number of family members in the military. And so those conversations are incredibly difficult because on the one hand, the military offers limited opportunity, right? On the other hand, the indoctrination, this idea that it offers security and that we are safer as Americans. Hawaii is not safer under America's thumb. Pearl Harbor would never have been bombed if, if the United States didn't have a military base in Hawaii, right? Like it's actually kind of easy to poke holes in these narratives. And so women activists in Hawaii, um, anti-nuclear activists, uh, organizers from organizations like Women's Voices and Women's Speaks and Decolonial Pinais and others have articulated a new kind of language. They talk about genuine security. Um, and genuine security works in opposition to this blanket idea of national security that can be achieved through force and violence and instead asks, how is it that we meet the essential needs of all people to make you genuinely secure? How do we make sure people are fed and have shelter and have access to quality education and health care? And all of these things are things we could do better in the United States with a smaller military budget. But also, we would all be healthier without the kind of training and indoctrination that the military does. And one of the things I want just to poke in your heads for a bit, especially because I've I notice a few people from Hawaii are Hawaiians in the room. I can tell by what you're wearing and the way you look. Um, it's just a thing, we just know. Um, the other question we need to ask those of us from Hawaii and Hawaiians, what does it mean to be from a place that trains so many soldiers to go off and take violence elsewhere? It is not just our land that is harmed, but we are the place where they come. The PTA, the Pohakuloa Training, okay, I don't know what it is, it's called the PTA. At the base of this mountain, is like one of the most important training areas in all of US military um, bases. It's like the center of their, their training strategy. So what does it mean to be home to that? How is that also a part of our responsibility, our kuleana, not just to protect the land, but that shouldn't happen in our name. That's not the gift of what you give to the world. Um, so I think you start there with, with those questions, right? Like, are we safer? Are all of us safer? Is it okay to sacrifice some for the few? Um, these are the questions we're gonna have to ask ourselves, especially now as we move into what feels to be um, a future marked by more and more inequality, less and less access to resources for so many, and because of that, increased policing and violence, right, as justification, right, because it's so, it's so unsafe. We can create safety. Um, people do it every day, actually, without guns. There were no guns, there were no weapons at the Pu'uhonu at Pu'uhulu. And the only time we felt unsafe is when we heard the cops coming. So, other questions? Thank you. Um, so, I'm sure I'll, I'll hold on that. Um, I, my name is Luis, I'm from the Island of Beijing. Um, I've got to say, you know, there's a lot of things I can say. Thank you. Um, I'm curious. Um, so you've spoken on the, the effects of uh, like the, the way in which like military and police are uh, used to to further colonial ends. Mm. I know that tourism is another big. Um, Why do you want to talk about tourism? Make me all mad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Um, another big way that, that sort of uh, colonial ends are are mm -hmm. and, and affected um, in in. In Guam, Guam, and Wigan. Um, I'm curious how. Um, uh, Puhonua? Yes. Like how the how they have interacted with mm. tourism and how like because tourism has sort of to do with like the public image and sort of world face of like a place. Whether those, um, I guess, I don't know, whether like the discourses that have been happening in the Pukunua have um, like spoken out at, mm. back at, or about tourism explicitly, whether they've changed like, in, yep. in, in any direction. You know, like, like what is the, what happens when you intersect like, like tourism and public Pukunua as like a, a concept and, and, and institution? 
That's a great question. Um, oh, tourism. What do we say about it? We got we to start with tourism. Uh, there's a, if you want to know how Hawaiians feel about tourism, there's a great essay by Honani K. Tras called Lovely Hula Hands. I'll just repeat the last line to you. It says, so if you're thinking of coming to my homeland, don't. We don't want any more tourists. We certainly, or we don't need any more tourists. We certainly don't like them very much. Uh, not everyone feels that way, but I agree. I agree unequivocally with everything Honani says. So there's that. Tourism. So Hawaii is this really interesting place. We exist as a part of America's empire because of our strategic positioning, right, in the middle of the Pacific, about halfway between Japan and the continental United States. Um, but around like the 1940s and 50s, there was a clear understanding by many of those uh, wealthy haole families living in Hawaii. These are like descendants of people who came over originally as missionaries and then decided, oh, we could make a lot of money here. We could buy up some land. We could make some sugar plantations and use really cheap labor from Asia, um, contract labor from Asia, and we could make all this money. But now there's this turn in the 1940s and the 1950s where they realize we could sell Hawaii in a different way as well. This doesn't just have to be about land speculation. This could be about an experience. And so all these things that were illegal earlier in the territory of Hawaii, uh, like Hawaiian language and dance and, and gathering in certain ways, get refigured to, um, to tell a welcoming story of Hawaii, right? And so hula becomes really big, right? And so certain Hawaiian practices become really big um, and acceptable. Right, certain performance of Hawaiianness is acceptable, and all of that is like bought up into this tourism scheme. And so, tourism does a lot of horrible things. One, it sells things that don't belong to the people making money off of it. Right, my culture doesn't belong to you, my language doesn't belong to you, and my smile certainly doesn't belong to you. It also makes it very, very difficult for Hawaiians to survive living in Hawaii, but also long term non Hawaiian residents. The cost of living has skyrocketed in Hawaii. In 1993, when Honani wrote that piece, uh, she said that, uh, I think she said that residents, this is when there were like three million tourists a year. There's like now 10 to 11 million tourists coming to Hawaii a year. She said that residents were outnumbered by tourists 10 to one, Hawaiians were outnumbered by tourists 30 to one. So it also creates this environment in which the entire place is meant for someone else. And so we make decisions about development, about the laws we keep to keep certain order in certain places, all about creating a certain picture and experience for others. So that's in case you want to know the history of why tourism sucks in Hawaii, along other things. Uh, they also create a lot of waste and they treat our land really poorly. What does that have to do with the Pu'uhonua? You know, there's one example I can use from my experience at Pu'uhulu that's really interesting because once the movement started to kind of blow up, there were a lot of people interested in kind of seeing what was up. And some of us described it as like Hawaiian Disneyland at times, right? That there were people who just like, they just wanted the experience. And some of those folks were Hawaiians from around the world and we were happy to, to bring them home. And some of them were, we would describe as tourists, right? They just like wanted like, these, these guys are doing some cool stuff. I heard about protocol three times a day. We can watch hula for free. Like, let's, let's check it. I'm telling you, this is what it felt like at times. And if, you, if I was working at the, vis there was a visitor's tent that basically, and the visitor's tent was meant to receive people and to figure out how, where they belonged. And not in a way like, you don't belong here, but like, what good could they do for the Pu'uhonua? What are your skills? Do you wanna go work in the kitchen? Do you wanna go work in what was originally called Kanaka Costco? And make sure people have like, re the, like the materials that they need. Do you want to go take care of the elderly in the Hale Kupuna Kako? Are you a doctor? Can you go work with the medics? But the, the, the receiving tent also had to deal with a lot of these tourists. And if you put me in there, I would have sent them all in their way because I'm not very nice and not very strategic. But every single person who came, this is one of the wonderful things about the Pu'uhonua and how it, asks, it calls us to a higher version of ourselves, right? Um, Kapu Aloha, I didn't talk about this in the presentation because it's kind of too big of an idea to get through, but Kapu Aloha was one of the like governing laws of the Pu'uhonua which literally means a, um, a law around aloha. Um, and many of our leaders have described it as, you know, sacred place, sacred conduct. 
And that cup a little hole requires you to rise to the best version of yourself at all times and to recognize when you're not that best, best version to remove yourself. And the Pu'uhonua like inspired that in folks. So every new person who came, it was, a mo it was an opportunity for education and it was an opportunity to make connections and it was an opportunity to kindly put people in their place like no, like don't take pictures, like this isn't an experience. Um, are you ready to do work? Because this is a place where people work and labor is visible. Um, so that kind of thing was happening on the front line. But I think to the theory of your question, the Pu'uhonua as an institution has a lot to push back on tourism, where tourism is about anyone with money can get anything they want, right? That your key to access is wealth. Um, it's not responsibility, it's not relationships, it's certainly not consent, because nothing about the tourism industry in Hawaii is consensual relationship. And the Pu'uhonua couldn't be more antithetical to that. Everything is about relationships, right? Nobody cares how much money you got, people care, like, what, like where can you meet me in the middle here? What can you offer to build with us? Um, and how is that gonna strengthen our community? And you don't, you don't just pack up and leave the Pu'uhonua. Right? You don't just cease to exist in relationship to the Pu'uhonua when you leave, like when you get on the plane, the Hawaiian Airlines plane that takes you back to Kansas. Or, I don't know why I said, I hope, I'm sorry. Kansas is a great place. I've never been. Um, but what I mean to say is like a place that, do you have relations here? Um, and the Pu'uhonua is always asking you about your relationships. What's your relationship to this environment? What's your relationship to these deities? What's your relationship to the movement? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. I'll keep thinking about that because I, before your question, I didn't ever really think about taking it in that direction, but it's, I think, important considering the kinds of things we're going through right now in Hawaii. Uh, yeah. Good to meet you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, like, I'm not going to have a class in university. How did you navigate your own, like, music and identity in a school that's, like, where you're doing a lot of, like, a Hmm. That's a great question. Um, so, to me, being in... Being a student, and in particular being a college student, is one of the hardest but most important things you need to do is to find your people. Um, and when I went to Stanford, there were, in my year, there were 10 other Hawaiians, or I think there were 10 other Hawaiians who got in that year. And so we we're all going up together and there was this idea that like, like this is the year. Um, and you might come to think like, okay, those are gonna be my people, because they're literally like, they're my people. And they were all really great people, but they weren't my people. Like on the political side, like they weren't my people at all. Not all, what is this, the saying, not all skin folk are kin folk? Who said that? Anyone, it's brilliant, because it's true. Um, and when you are one of few, and I don't just mean racially or ethnically, but intellectually, and I don't mean smarter than everyone, I just mean you're thinking about different things, and you're engaged in a different way, and you're there for something else, because Stanford, they can party, and that was fun, but I was there for something else. You have to find people who are doing that with you. And they don't necessarily, sometimes they look like you, and you can, you can engage on a certain level because you're enduring similar violences as them, but sometimes they don't look like you. Um, and for me at Stanford, there was a really vibrant, um, like, native community. And the Hawaiians were included in that, but the Hawaiians weren't the most radical. And I wanted to be with the radical kids, right? So I made friends with Dakota and Lakota and, and Inuit and, and other native folks around campus and black folks who were doing the dopest work on campus and Palestinians, right? And those people, that's where we made community with each other because we cared about the same things. Um, being away from home, especially a place like Hawaii that is, that is, like it's not just our family we miss, but it's the Aina that we miss. Like nothing was more impactful to me finishing school than finding 
my people in the most unexpected ways. And so I would say, like, for those of you, whether you're from Hawaii or not, right, you're trying to figure out, like, man, I'm homesick. There are a lot of people in any space, right? A lot of people that I don't really jive with. We're not thinking about the same thing. We're not on the same trajectory. If you're here, there's someone else like you here. And if there's someone else like you here, there's someone else like them. And there might be someone who's like completely different, but it's gonna push you in a really interesting direction. Um, and all of this, this whole experiment you're in called college, all of it's about relationships. All of it. It's not about the textbooks. It's not even about the theory. It's not about the problem sets and the tests. It's about the relationships you build here with your professors, with your classmates, with yourself. Um, and that's, that's where we do the work that makes life not just livable, but joyous. Yeah? So if you haven't found your people, I hope you find them because it took me two years. So it, sometimes it can take time. Thank you for your question. I hope you get to go home soon. It's cold here. <laughs> yeah. Are you saying I'm not very convincing? No, because I have a little why because I went to my friend who was about some reason. So I was like, this is my last opportunity to be able to get to free. So like I know why people want to go there and get so beautiful and so many things and I also know that it's just you know the Americans especially were like we have money, we have the right to have fun. Mm -hmm. And this, I was thinking about it recently um, from Sam, so it's a really good thing Harry Potter video game. It's like an ongoing argument where people are like, oh, but I don't care that they are all in like fun from all this local life because my childhood, I was very Right, this is just fun. Or like, the Chick fil A thing. Like, I know they're not, but the chicken's so good. <laughs> It's not even that good, guys. <laughs> it's just chicken nuggets. I'm sorry, I've had it. It's just chicken nuggets. Oh, yeah, like Yep. Yep. Have you? Have I? Okay, so this, is a, this is a really good question because um, I hate that I can't cite this. I hate when I can't cite my sources, but I, someone wrote on Twitter once that Hawaii, you know, the epic archive of Twitter, um, <laughs> Hawaii is the place where even the most politically conscious go to sleep. And that really struck me. Because, first of all, we all care about what we care about because it's close to us. That's the truth. And that's why building relationships matter, because it takes things that are far away from us and brings it close. And then we start to see ourselves as a part of something larger. Um, but I have so many brilliant, um, friends that I would describe as radical in a number of ways um, or even acquaintances that I kind of see from afar who are always ready to go on their like Hawaiian Islands vacation or Fiji or Tahiti or, and I get it, it's gorgeous. But we make decisions in our everyday lives about what matters and what doesn't. And I, I, don't, I know your question is have I ever convinced someone. I don't, you know, I don't know if I've ever, I'm certainly not gonna convince some people some people ain't gonna care right now in this moment. Um, some people are fleeting like that uh, and we have to let them go. Um, and some people are ready to have a difficult conversation about how your actions impact me profoundly. That they do actual harm to both the place that I live but also the person that I am. And so yeah, I think people's minds are changed when we are able to have those conversations but those conversations can't happen on Twitter. And they can't happen, they could happen in a Q&A, but they can't happen in a presentation that is one way. Because there's no relationship there, right? That's just me spitting stuff at you that either sticks or doesn't stick. And so I think to your greater point, which is really like how, how do we one, get people to see the relationship, relationship between our choices and harm? and that we actually are empowered in that way to make choices that don't harm others. 
um, that care for others. How do we do that? Um, and, and then how do we in ourselves actually develop a more meaningful and ongoing practice of relation building? Right, because that's the that's the two way street, and none of us are perfect, and all of us are implicated in a number of violences. That is the truth. That is really terrifying to hear, but it's the truth. There's violence done in our names all the time. We just we'll just say the military. That that counts all. all any of you guys not Americans? Lucky, uh, but if you're Americans and you're in this room, there's all kinds of violence being done in your name, right? That feels really big. That doesn't mean we don't have control over a number of other violences that are taking place. And they can be the small things. The small things add up to the big things, right? Ruth Wilson Gilmore, abolition, you need to change one thing, which is everything. And we don't do that by standing on a soapbox. We do that by making friends, by talking to people who disagree with us, um, when it feels safe to talk to people who disagree with us. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Um, <laughs> well, okay. So, so this is what I this is what I want to say about that. Yeah, Hawaii is really beautiful. It's gorgeous. The food is amazing. So I'm kind of selling Hawaii. Um, and the people are are beautiful and all these things. Okay, but how much better would that experience be if you had relations with someone there? If you had invitation? I'm not saying people who aren't from Hawaii can't come to Hawaii. I'm saying you know, be lucky enough to make a friend. Because everyone says when they come to Hawaii, like, I felt something special. Like, okay, maybe you felt something special, but you didn't feel what my friends feel when I take them to Hawaii. You didn't, I can promise you. Because I know where to take you. And I know, I know how to hang out with people who can move these clouds. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not joking, like they, they move them all the time. So if they can do that, they can make the aina feel, reach out to you in a different way, right? So that's, that's I'm trying to change the way we think about movement and access. Um, I'm not saying everyone in this room has to take the pledge, I'm never gonna go to Hawaii. I'm saying if you find yourself in Hawaii, having not been invited, try to find a way to meaningfully engage, right? That doesn't mean just staying in an Airbnb because those are all owned by outside investors anyway who are destroying our island, but try to find a way to meaningfully engage. And if not, and if you're on this fence where you're like, maybe I shouldn't be going there, if you're invited, that's different. Consent is granted. And then do it in a good way. Um, we love to extend the invitation. That's the other thing. Like, I love to extend the invitation. We don't get a chance to. Yeah, but thank you. Uh, uh, here, and then don't let me forget you. Mahalo. <laughs> Mahalo. Um, but I wanted to talk to you a point about military national security and human social infrastructure. And then I want to ask you to speak to your concept of gender in the point because the time our family is more of it. And so we consider us having two children. I don't know what to do about it.
Yep. Still, yep. You know his middle name is Pu Honua? It's wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I when I first started my the research for my dissertation, I, I thought I was gonna do a study of, of gender and then I realized it was like too big. Um, and too scary, and so I kind of pivoted to look at a study of Hawaiian relationships. Um, so I'll just start by saying I'm not an expert in Hawaiian gender, but I do think there's a few things that I can kind of reveal to folks to show a different world is possible. Um, so in the Hawaiian language, which is the best language in the world, um, we have a number of pronouns, like dozens of pronouns. None of them give a shit about your gender or your sex. Like you can't tell. Um, all, all they care about, all we care about, is your relationship to the speaker. So if I say kako, that means literally everyone in this room, including me. If I say mako, I'm talking to you guys, but it's just us guys over here who's in my group. If I say lako, I'm talking to you guys, but we're talking about those guys over there. Don't talk to lako. Uh, if I say oko, it's all of you and not me. And then I can do all of that in pairs. So like koa, or I'm talking to you, moa, loa. Um, olua, right? All kinds of pronouns. Pronouns are very useful. Um, they help you understand your relation, in a Hawaiian way of thinking, they help you understand your relationship. But in no way in the Hawaiian mind is your gender or your sex actually forwarded information that we need to know in conversation. It's not. I need to know who's included and who's excluded. I need to know your relationship to the speaker, your proximity to the speaker, your intimacy to the speaker. Um, this makes for a very obvious, like different articulation of gender, even in the current conversations that are happening right now, right? Obviously, we don't live in a world, even in Hawaii, we're not living in a world where everyone's speaking Hawaiian, but if we were, if we were, then all pronouns would be said with love, first of all and your personhood would not be reduced to your sex or your gender. Um, and I think that's really important. And you know, you bring up a really important point, right, with the kane, wahine, and mahu. Mahu are a third gender uh, in, in the Hawaiian universe. I like to say universe like marble. We got our own universe in the Hawaiian universe. Um, mahu traditionally, historically, were healers. Uh, they were people who were prized in our communities as being able to move across spectrum and present across spectrum. There's also language in a number of stories where they say this person, uh, they ku awahine or ku akane, they stood as a man or stood as a woman. So there's this idea that like you could move into other gendered spaces in your own body. So there was a fluidity that I find really interesting that also crosses over into the kind of relational aspect when we talk about intimacy and, and relations. And a lot of this stuff 
I don't know if the, the workshop that's happening tomorrow is public, but anyone who is going to that, we're gonna talk about that in more detail. We'll get into the, the sexy, um, kind of gender, sex, intimacy stuff more there. But yeah, that's kind of the, the basics that I can offer here. If you want to know more about Hawaiian gender, you should uh, look up, oh, oh yeah, Colonial Hua Young. Um, um, yeah, if you look up young Hawaiian mahu, you might find a lot of young Hawaiian mahu. <laughs> <laughs> we have this problem a lot. Um, she can teach you a lot about mahu. There's also uh, uh, Kumuhina, um, who does work around mahu, and their name is escaping me at this moment. Um, I'm sorry, their name's escaping me. I can't. I can't tell you, but I'll probably remember right after we're done. Um, you had a question. Thank you. Um, Great question. I am also pro rage because I am a native queer woman. Um, Honani K. Trask once wrote, I think it was in a poem, and I don't know exactly where it is because my my ex just used to quote it to me all the time. Um, uh, Aloha is rage and rapture. And you all, whether you're from Hawaii or Hawaiian or not, have gotten a very particular picture of what aloha is in your lives. I'm sure you've encountered the word. I'm sure you've seen images related to it. And it's all about, you know, openness and uh, hospitality and sometimes sex and then flowers and Lilo and Stitch. Um, <laughs> all happy things, right? But aloha is also rage and rapture. It is intensity. It is um, this, this mountain this volcano was made from a violent eruption in the middle of the ocean. That's what pulled our islands out from the depth of the darkness. That is not soft and cuddly or forgiving. There's nothing forgiving about an eruption. You guys ever seen an eruption? Magnificent, but not forgiving. I want to go back to an earlier idea that, that I learned from Pua Case about Kapu Aloha. Right, sacred place, sacred conduct, uh, or the rising to the best version of yourself and then the recognition when you are not. I believe in rage. I believe in anger. I believe we're entitled to it. And I also believe that it is often necessary and useful and protective. There's an intelligence to anger. I think anyone who says that you can't be angry and that it's not productive needs to shut the F up because they don't know what they're talking about. And perhaps, luckily, they haven't struggled enough to understand. Good for you. Rage is useful. Rage is in my body. Rage is exhausting. It is heavy. In Hawaiian, the word for sadness is the same word for heavy. Kaumaha. Um, the pu'uhonua is a place of healing. It doesn't mean there isn't rage there. there there was plenty of anger in those spaces. They were desecrating our mountain, our ancestor. They arrested our elders. They carried them away, zip tied them. They had their frickin' riot gear on and their batons scraping on the ground. They had the long range acoustic device sound cannon pointed at pregnant women. There was rage everywhere. And I'm not, I don't wanna draw this bullshit timeline of like, Progress, progression from rage to healing and then we're all good. Like, I don't think that's how things work and I don't actually think that that's where we need to head, but we do need spaces where we feel healing happening. And for that, I need, I need a space where I feel safe enough to let the rage subside. 
to put down the armor, right? And so I think of the Pu'uhonua as places where we can build systems of safety, of security, where we can like exhale. And yeah, maybe from the state side, right? I, I'd like what you said, you talked about uh, radical forgiveness. When the Pu'uhonua was established as a status institution, and it was, right? The, the, kingdom of, the kingdom was a state. It was about radical forgiveness from the state towards the populace, right? That there, there were opportunities of refuge, that punishment was not necessarily the, cent the central function of the state to legitimize itself. That's really important. But for the people, for the Lahui, the populace, the Pu'uhonua isn't a place where we're just supposed to go forgive people. It's a place where we're supposed to be able to build with each other and care for each other. Um, and I think that that's an important distinction. And yeah, that's, I, I'll start talking myself in circles if I keep going, but that's what I'm thinking right now in this moment about your question. I think it's really important. Um, and I think that shouldn't just happen at the Pu'uhonua, that in going back to the other question about, you know, like finding your people, um, we all also need people who make us feel safe because we do live in a society with the absence of generally these institutions to turn to. Um, and so what the Pu'uhonua teaches us is that anyone can build them anywhere. So just go build it. Make those communities for yourself. No one else is gonna do it. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you. Um, okay. I don't know if you have one more. Yeah, let's do one more. Yeah, I saw you first, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sam? Yeah. Good to meet you, Sam. Not only. Well, I know you're kind of important. Do you guys know Prentice Hemphill? Finding Our Way podcast. Look it up. Listen to it. Oh, the best. We're really lucky. Sorry. Go out. Ask your question. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, can you guys say au puni? Oh. You guys are really good. You guys take Hawaiian language classes? <laughs> okay. Au puni means government. Um, like the, it's like the government building. If you have laws in your government, it's the laws. If, if you have a supreme ruler, it is the supreme ruler. They're the head of the au puni, the head of state. It's the state. Lahui, can you guys say Lahui? Lahui, Lahui means um, the people. It means the collective. Hui means to gather and to be like, we call our clubs Hui, right? So it means to like gather as a populace. Um, Hawaiians were very intentional with how they use these words in writing. I've never, and I haven't read everything written by a Hawaiian, but I have never seen um, a discrepancy uh, in a writer's description of these two things as separate. I think that's really, really interesting. Um, there was this idea, especially in Hawaii, that the right to rule, and again, those of you come to the workshop will talk more about this, the right to rule was, um, was inscribed directly in the ability for the ruler to engage in just relations with the people that they ruled. And there's examples, there's thousands of different examples. One of the best examples is that in Ka'u, on the island of Hawaii, uh, the island that this mountain is on, um, like there were a number of chiefs that were basically killed by their people because they weren't good chiefs. The people were hungry and so they killed the chief because the chief didn't look out for the needs of the people or the people felt like they were being over policed so they killed the chief um, until they got a good one and if they got a worse one then they killed that one too. Um, there is this idea that, that the, the leaders rule and maintain the state only if the state is good only if the state can meet the needs of the people. And that's why we say things like, he aina he kawa ke kanaka. the land is the chief and the people are its servants. But it also means that those closest to the land have the most power. And inevitably, as you move up the ranks into chiefdom, 
your hands aren't in the lo'i anymore and you're not pulling fish out of the fish ponds anymore. You got someone else doing that work for you and feeding you and doing all the nice things. Um, the guys, who, the, the, the people who turn their hands down to the ground, we say, huli kalima ilalo, the people with dirt under their fingernails, they, as the law hui, as the maka'ina knows, the people of the land, they create all the power. They are the power, right? People power, yeah, this makes sense. But it's all written into the different um, like Hawaiian sayings and, and like scriptures that have been passed down from time to time that the, the mo'i, the supreme ruler, is a figurehead. And he often, usually lots of times he, but sometimes she, has a certain kind of influence but as Nili Okalani, the last reigning monarch, said, the voice of the people is the voice of God. That I am empowered to do things because the voice of the people is the voice of God. And so when Nili Okalani, this is really, this is the last thing I think I'll say about this. In 1893, January 17th, there was an armed coup, basically staged by 13 Haole businessmen in Hawaii. They called their friends at the US Marines, had them landed at Honolulu Harbor. They said white property, actually they said American, but the only Americans who were in Hawaii were white, so white property is being threatened, and li lives. American property and lives are being threatened. Will you come land some troops here? This is how the overthrow ends up happening. Lili Okalani sees this, and in her power as the Mo'i, she surrenders to the United States. She surrenders the Aupuni, the government, to the United States so that the Lahui can live, so that the people won't die because we are outgunned, we are outmatched. And everything that's happened since, from the fight against annexations, um, this picture, right, from the fight against annexation in 1898, which was successful, by the way, there's no treaty of annexation, so ask your friends about that to um, the armed rebellion in 1895, to everything that was happening in the 1860s and 1870s, all of that was about Lahui. All of it was about people. Yes, we love our government. We love the idea of the kingdom. We, we want to restore the kingdom because the government we live under now is vicious and horrible and cares nothing for us. But if it ain't good for the people, it ain't gonna happen. And that's why I think that those distinctions are really important because it's easy to get lost in movement, fighting for an idea. It is much more pow powerful to fight for, for, for people, for the souls, right? The souls of our, our nations. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Anyway, thank you guys.